So what do you think from a from an anti-aging perspective were the most important uh, biomarkers that changed? Like for example, did you do OGTTs or euglycemic clamps? I mean, how much did you uh, uh, scrutinize uh, glucose disposal and insulin sensitivity in these people? Yeah, we, we didn't do clamps. Uh, l let me tell you, there are two kinds of aging. There's primary aging, which is more like senescence mm. or mitochondrial dysfunction or, uh, you, you know, leaky membrane. And there is secondary aging, which is basically the impact of your environment and your lifestyle. When you ask about insulin sensitivity or cardiovascular factor, it's more secondary aging. And here we did a lot of measures. And uh, Bill Krauss published a, a quite cited paper uh, like five years after the end of the study in JAMA on all the cardiovascular, cardiometabolic risk factors. And everything was tremendously improved despite the fact that these people were healthy to begin with. BMI 22 to 27.9 and so on. And a remarkable improvement in all these markers of secondary aging. Now, when it comes to primary aging, that's a different story because, you know, it's much more difficult to measure autophagy, to measure mitochondrial function, to measure leakiness of a cell membrane in these people. And what we ended up to measure was really uh, some of these uh, biomark or, you, you know, the hallmarks of aging. You have probably seen these papers. Of course, yeah. There was one in 2012 and one 10 years later. Uh, you know, we, we don't have as many data that we would like. But for example, we did measure mitochondrial biogenesis by looking at the relationship between nuclear uh, uh, markers and mitochondrial DNA. And we uh, observed in humans that there was an increased mitochondrial biogenesis. Despite the fact that you use less energy, you become more efficient, you improve, you increase your biogenesis of, of mitochondria, which is quite spectacular because the ROS production or these reacts, reactive oxygen species are produced by older mitochondria. The new mitochondria are much more efficient. They, they, they don't produce as many ROS. So let me make sure I understand that, Eric. Sorry. You're saying yep. that the people in the CR group had a greater turnover of their mitochondria. Yep. And it's interesting. The muscle, skeletal muscle, he was. Yeah. And, and, and so we would expect that people who are calorically restricted would have lower ROS generation, but we would expect that the reason for that is lower substrate utilization. You're saying, yeah, they had lower ROS generation, but it might actually be just as much from the fact that they had more mitochondrial biogenesis and they were using newer machinery for the substrate utilization. So it could be both of those things are reducing ROS. Is that what you're saying? You are right. Absolutely right. I think it's both. Uh, you, you know, when it comes to mitophagy, you know, these old mitochondria, it's been shown in insect, in rodents, that this is improved with caloric restriction. Autophagy, of course, all these organelles in the cells. Did you measure any of the tubules or anything for autophagy? No. No, LC2, no. okay. But we measured mitochondrial turnover by, by this method, and we found that it was increased with uh, with caloric restriction. And I think you you are right on the on the point here. There's both mechanism, less energy requirement, but also more efficient mitochondria. Today, if you were to do this study, for example, I mean, I know the legacy study isn't the same because not as many of the people are going to still be carrying out. But if you could go back and look at the banked samples, are there any other biomarkers you would be able to look at today 
vis-a-vis the hallmarks of aging? Is there anything we could be doing to better understand senescence? Um, how, what would you look at in terms of inflammatory markers? I would certainly put that down as primary aging. How much of a, a, a suite of the interleukins, uh, TNF and things of that nature did you look at? Yeah, I mean, we did. We did at, at uh, 6, 12, uh, 24 months. We didn't do 18 months for that. But we had the whole panel of uh, inflammation and high sensitivity CRP and then all the interleukin, TNF-alpha. Everything and improved and... or just some things? No, everything improved. One thing which was spectacular when it comes to immune function, we did some imaging of the thymus mm. and there was loss of fat. Involution. Oh, oh, involution. Okay, fat reduction. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a reduction of uh, fat in the thymus. And our friend, uh, Deep Dixit, was all excited by that. And this is why he, he pursue all the uh, immune, uh, you know, responses from transcriptomics in different tissues and all that. But, you know, we, we chronic inflammation, first of all, it was not abnormal to begin with, but there was right. tremendous improvement. And I think that uh, Bill Krauss, in the discussion of his paper, if I recall, he, he used the Framingham index of Cardio, cardio metabolic health, and there was an improvement uh, in the age. Yep. I, I don't know exactly the index. Yeah, using the, using the Framingham risk calculator, of course, yeah. everything would have got better based on yeah. the biomarkers. And it was quite spectacular. It, it was like they were gaining 10 years in two years. <laughs> I mean, again, Eric, I, I think it's very interesting, and I, I think it is hands down the best experimental evidence we have that caloric restriction for those who can do it may indeed be um, a great tool. Uh -huh.